This episode is brought to you by PopCultureZone.com. For all your cleaning and pressing needs and as low as $5.99 a book, be sure to check them out. With over 8,000 books cleaned and pressed, PopCultureZone.com. What's going on, guys? It's Brian and Jack with Some Man's Comics. Of course, we got another week. So we're back with that three up, three down. We're talking about comic book market trends. We're going to give you three of the hot ones and three of the cold ones, aren't we, Jack? Oh, absolutely. A lot going on in the comic market. Things are starting to settle down, but getting some Hollywood news. And people are bullish about a lot of these newer characters. So some exciting stuff to talk about. Yeah, we're going to get into it right now. Starting with that first one on the three-up portion, we are talking about Something is Killing the Children. We tend to talk about them a lot on this channel, but right now there's definitely a trend where people are buying up these copies. They're buying up the older copies. They're buying up the later printings. They're buying up the new ones, and they got those incentive variants. I don't know if it's because people are thinking of the Netflix show that might happen. I don't know if it's because it's just a great story by James Tinian, great character. We've talked about this before, but why do you think this is up, Jack? Well, Brian, this is all about a James Tinian tweet. Um, and nothing moves books like a simple tweet from a comic book creator. Um, James Tinian shared that he was currently uh, in talks about a project, um, and that's something that he had been working on, a Hollywood project. And that sent everybody naturally to make that leap to something's killing the children, which is probably his most predominant independent work to date that's not already attached to somewhere. Because, of course, the Woods and Menick are both already attached to some sort of uh, production company. So people made that leap. And here's the thing. They're probably not wrong. I think something's killing the children, Netflix, is kind of the easiest assumption to make. But it is an assumption. So you do have to caution that. I don't have any problems with the prices that are being paid for something that's going to children as the Frizen book has now reached $20, a book, Brian, that you and I got told when that book came out and we were sharing it pre-FOC would never be worth anything because we had ruined the book is now worth five times cover price. So that just goes to show you that when the community likes a book, when the art on a book is amazing, when the writing is incredible, when a character like Erica Slaughter, who I've gone on record saying is the best character in independent comics, I think it's the most marketable character. She's going to be a star. Um, it, when you have all of those things, that print run, it doesn't matter because you know it's all about having a demand that's larger than the supply, and you certainly see that here. People are excited. And the thing that I like about this book, Brian, we got comments on our, our uh, YouTube you know, channel with various people when we bring up this book. Always say the same thing. Man, I just read this. I just picked up a trade, and this book is great. And that's the thing. If the book is great, then you have something there. The movie has potential. Uh, the, the, the books have a chance to actually stand the test of time. So this is one I'm real bullish on, even though we've already seen increases on it. Yeah, like we always say, if you haven't been picking it up, Pick it up and trade and let us know what you think. Because just as you said, I haven't met someone yet that was like, was it for me? Yeah, everybody loves that book. Then the next one we're talking about in the three-up portion this week is Echo. This is a character that's starting to gain some traction. But Jack, for our viewers who may not know who Echo is, can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, Echo's a popular Daredevil character who uh, kind of came into prominence during that, you know, like Alex Maleev uh, second volume during that uh, Marvel Knights series. And she first appeared in Daredevil number nine, uh, is a, featured on a few covers with the issues after that. Always had cult popularity and was real popular uh, kind of speculation prediction to show up in the Daredevil TV series. Now, it never happened. But recently, there was a casting announcement that appeared on the GLADD, which is the Greater Los Angeles Agency on Deafness Facebook page, um, looking for casting for a Latina female deaf uh, character for upcoming television series, believed to be Disney+. Plus, um, and that would kind of fit into uh, um, this character. So um, they were looking for either a Latina or a Native American kind of character character. Uh, or person to play the role so um you know it's one of those things when there's smoke there's fire so that has the first appearance uh that daredevil number nine book skyrocketing up 30 to 40 dollars um and as well as some of those later issues issue 10 and 11 where she featured on the cover we're starting to see those issues take off um as well so a lot of people are bullish on the character people really seem to like like her and uh it doesn't surprise me because again we've seen this before and you can always kind of tell 
when and once it kind of something happens in the market, people jumped on it. Like I mentioned, when the Daredevil TV series came on, she was one of the original characters people got excited about. That always kind of indicated that this character had potential. And so I'm not surprised now that apparently Marvel's going forward with her to see that her books are heating up. Yeah, this is another one that talks about that trend that we talk about a lot with that spec cycle. This is like kicking off that spec cycle, right? Absolutely. So now if you can find it cheap, definitely pick it up. But the news will come out, they'll kind of trickle down. You'll probably see an alert where it's increased 400% because it went from zero copies sold to four copies sold. But either way, if you find it cheap now, maybe pick it up. But these upward trends, these three up that we're talking about, a lot of times you might want to just hold off just a second. You can get it on the downside, right? Right. And just because of that reason, if you're like me, who I bought these books in anticipation of the character showing up for Daredevil, I've had several copies of her first appearance just sitting in a short box, kind of collecting dust over the last few years that I've taken with me to comic conventions and tried to sell for $10 and haven't been able to. I'm more than happy right now to sell these books and take the $30, $35 that I can get for them now. So I think if you're in that sort of scenario, yeah, go ahead and sell before they start dropping. Right. Then the last one we're going to talk about on the three-up portion this week is everyone's well aware of them, especially those Miles Morales ones, but the other ones are starting to trend up as well. And we're talking about those hip-hop variants from Marvel. There was a couple volumes of these, right? Right. And it's all about starting with that Miles Morales. So the Miles Morales book was $25. It was already popular. It was a tough-to-get book. It had come out after several other ones, and I think people had started to kind of um, get kind of just fatigue with them. And uh, now that book is a $500 book. Now, it seems silly to say that I almost laughed. I love the cover. Uh, you know, it's, it's it, you know, an homage to Nas's first album, which certainly is one of my personal favorites of all time. But um, it's, it's a great cover and a, a uh, important book. But at the same point, I'm surprised by how much it's going for. And whenever something like that happens, you know, and that book becomes almost un, unattainable for people. People start looking for, okay, well, what's the next thing? What's the next book that's going to spike like that? So suddenly people went to the, um, the uh, Silk number one uh, hip-hop variant, which is, a, uh, I believe, a Nicki Minaj homage. And then people also started looking at the uh, Gwen Stacy uh, uh, Spider-Gwen book, which is a homage to Slick Rick. Um, and those books have started to take off. So it's really related to those cast of characters, which I think, again, people are just feverish for that part of the Spider-Verse. And now that they can kind of smell blood with the, the, the Sony movie stuff that it's coming, people are grabbing Silk, they're grabbing Gwen, and they're grabbing Miles, and they're grabbing everything. But you also have what's going on in the country. And hip-hop is something that has spoken to these social issues from the beginning of time. On top of it, hip-hop is the number one music in the entire world at this point. It's the number one streamed music. Um, it, is, it is no longer just uh, a, a music form for just one community. It is, it is kind of very universal. And it is not surprising to me that people have connected with this series in this way. And I think that those three books aren't the only books that we're going to see kind of get some second life and, and, and kind of pop a little bit. So that's kind of something to pay attention to. And we did a few trade paperback uh, uh, videos, Brian. Uh, we ended up stopping the series because it just wasn't getting the traction that we'd hoped. And we wanted to give you guys content that you want. But one of the picks that I talked about was there's a coffee table book with all of the, the hip hop variants in it. And that kind of gives you the the cover art and the in the book in the album that it homages i think that's still a great grab for anybody who's into these hip-hop variants yeah like i said they did a couple rounds of them i i tend to pick up the 90s ones just because it was like nostalgia crossover with favorite characters but you the viewer let us know do you have a favorite of those hip-hop variants and or were you completionist because i know there's some people out there that got all of them yes and i'll tell you my favorite is iron man Number one, that uh, 50 Cent uh, first album, Get Rich or Die Try and Homage. Um, yeah. that, was, that was high school for me. So that was super cool. I like the, uh, I said 90s, but this one wasn't 90s, but I did like the Black Panther Jay-Z one. Oh yeah, the Black Album. Incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, I was working at a music store too when that album came out. So I remember the insane <laughs> hype of that album, uh, that album dropping. And I, I worked at not just a music store, but an independent hip hop music store. 
So we're gonna move over to the downward portion right now. And the first one we're talking about on three up, three down. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but it's definitely down. And we are talking about that comic distribution. We are hearing from retailers and we are seeing it on social media, but we got some distribution issues, don't we? Yeah, and it's kind of a pick your poison thing, Brian. Like it kind of doesn't matter which distributor we're talking about, there's issues. So to first, the first thing that we're hearing is this week's Dark Knight's uh, Death Metal, or last week's Dark Knight's Death Metal, um, it released just heavy, heavy, heavy damages from Diamond, which is just so par for the course with what you're getting from Diamond. And again, it's the number one really problem people have with Diamond. Everybody talks about the whole Monopoly aspect, and you and I, Brian, were right on board with saying that Monopoly is dangerous in this hobby. But at the same point, um, I think the real reason why people have a problem with the Monopoly is because of the shipping issues and Diamond's reluctance to truly um, answer those for whatever reason. They say they, they, they try, and it's, it's something they pay lip service to at every Diamond Retailer Summit. But yet, here we are. Uh, I mean, this is my 10th year covering this industry, and... Um, God, I can't remember a year when it wasn't the topic that bothered retailers more than anything else. And if they could just take it seriously and do whatever they need to do in order to change it, even in radical changes, um, you know, it, retailers everywhere are shipping out products safely. So I don't understand why a distributor can. Um, and then conversely, we have two new distributors. You have Lunar and you have UCS. Those are fancy names, but it's DCBS. Discount Comic Book Service, the website that a lot of people buy their pre-orders from, as well as Midtown Comics. And of course, everybody knows Midtown Comics because they are the number one advertiser in big two comic books. They're the number one retail chain as far as presence uh, online. Um, and we said when this happened that, Brian, you and I were worried that there were going to be some issues. The blurred line between retail and distributor, uh, I've seen it in other businesses, it just doesn't work. And I think we got a prime example with Dark Knight's uh, Death Metal, Speed Metal number one. There was a Peach Romoco cover B that was thrown out there. It was a regular cover price cover. Stores were already taking pre-order on the cover. Um, and suddenly, it got changed to a 1 in 25 variant at the very last second. Um, and I think that that was largely due to the demand for the issue the fact that so many people wanted the guy and i think it's a short-sighted move on dc's part they could have sold a ton of cover bees um instead they're going to now hold it over store's head to try to get it as a uh incentive you don't know who the artist is for the new cover bee and uh, you don't have art so you're judging it based on cover a and a blank cover b and this is exactly what gets retailers into trouble is when they've got to try to chase a variant at a $6 cover price, that book will cost $75 for a store to obtain. You can bet your butt they're going to be charging double ratio, trying to get $50 out of that book. Um, when, you know, the market, I don't have a problem with people paying $50 for that book, but the market should dictate that. But it's not going to get dictated that way because of the way that retailers are going to end up trying to do this. And we've seen it time and time again. We saw it with the late printing incentives. Um, incentives can be great, but when they're done like this to just push retailers to order more, it ends up hurting everyone. And I really think that this is something that comes from the fact that Diamond and DCBS can see in real time the demand of these books and they can just make influence DC to make these changes, especially, I say influence, it could be their decision making. I don't know. I don't know how that distribution works with the publisher. But these are the things that I'm afraid of were going to happen. Um, and I don't think it'll be the last we see of something like this. Because Especially if they got to refund a bunch of orders. And there's a lot of them that are doing that, right? Refund, right? Refunding cover price orders. Uh, there's a lot of, if you type in that book into Google and you hit shopping, you're going to see a lot of 404 pages where, you know, they had to pull that web page down real quick because suddenly that book's not available. So just... I don't like the change. I don't like the last secondness of it. And I don't like the fact that it seems like a greedy cash grab on DC's part. Um, unfortunate. Yeah. So, I mean, technically we mentioned distribution, but that could also be publisher, DC publishers down as well. If they're the ones that ultimately, you know, they made the choice. Either way, it's down. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on to the next one. So before Punchline, before Peach Momoko, a lot of people are talking about that character star. Not so many people are talking about that character right now, and it's moved to digital only, right? Yeah, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, the miniseries 
uh, or the new star series started and there was so much momentum. Um, and it's a character that really got affected by so many things from the shutdown of new comics. It, that really slowed it down. You look at the effort that was put into issue number one, look at the amount of store exclusives that were created for issue number one, look at the ratio incentives and the, 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 you know, artists that they went after to bring, they put a lot of high end artists on this book from, you know, J. Scott Campbell to G. Hyung Lee and uh, to, it, to then just a few issues later, bring it to digital. So, you know, if somebody wants to argue this with us, they'll, they'll still point out that the first appearance of the character is still solidly selling. Yeah, but it's, it's not selling as many copies by, at all, volume wise, as we're selling a few months back. And it's not selling for the dollar figure that it was selling for a few months back. Um, it hasn't dropped tanked completely. And I don't think it should because I think this is a good character. We were really, we were really skeptical about Star. This is one of those ones where it's like, if you ever want to think that Brian and I are like pig headed guys, this proves that we're not because we were very against this character and in its inception. And I did a 180. I did a complete 180 and you gave it time and then you came around. Um, so, you know, this is one of those things where I think this character has legs long-term. I mean, we're not at all downing this character. And that's one of the great things about the downside of this list is it really highlights buying opportunities, but I'm, I'm worried that the, where the publishing is with Marvel, that if, if they're going to do more of these digital only series and this character stays a digital only character, I think it'll be limited. And then that you're ultimately hoping for a movie appearance in an upcoming Captain Marvel sequel. And that's a tougher game. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. Yeah, I fully admit I was down. But I'm also one of those guys that the same thing with Punchline. I like to see how the character develops if it's going to be into something. That There's some people out there that just go like Cookie Monster with, with any first appearance and then you all wrong, wrong, gobble up any first appearance and think, oh, it's hot. But we've seen but a bunch of first appearances come and go. Let me ask you, though, the last couple uh, issues of Batman, have, has your opinion changed of Punchline between the Joker 80th and the... And Batman 92. I'm starting to be more intrigued with Punchline because now I'm starting to see that character flesh out. We're starting to see some dialogue, not just looking through some binoculars yeah. or, or looking like a, you know, a puppet in the background. But yeah, so I'm always, I just like to see what the character's going to do before I, I base my opinion on whether I like it or not and, and uh, read it and then pick it up. Just not go with the flow. Absolutely. But, but that brings us to the last one of the three down portion this week. This is one that kind of, I won't say hits me in the heart, but it's one that I still truly like, but no doubt I think it's kind of a downward trend. And we're talking about that AWA Upshot imprint publisher. Great stories, great creative teams on there, but they kind of seem to have lost the momentum. And I think a lot of that's due to the whole COVID situation and the stop in distribution. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I think the COVID situation definitely derailed a lot of what they were trying to do. When they began with this Upshot Now promo book, which was essentially like a trade paperback that gave black and white previews of all of their upcoming um, number ones that they were releasing, it really got people excited. You started to see names like Garth Ennis and um, J. Michael Straczynski, Mike Diodato Jr. And Raza uh, covers. Raza, Michael Morrissey. You know, These are names that like, Frank Chow, um, these are names that immediately got people's attention, and rightfully so. Um, a lot of people were excited for their upcoming slate of number ones. You and I did comment that I do think it was a mistake that they released so many so fast. Like there was like three books the first week, a couple books the second week. I think they needed to space them out to get better promotion behind each individual book. And I also think the whole uh, for artists, by artist type thing, which is great, but you, if you don't have anyone marketing, um that can be the issue there too so i haven't seen a huge strong marketing presence from them but they have boots on the ground marketing they had a heavy boots like convention marketing we've yes, talked about that. yeah they were heavy heavy at baltimore comic con um and and they did a, the people that they hired i think were just like part-time workers but they did a great job getting their stuff out there but yeah that's where the momentum was built from now it's kind of slowed down and i've, I've seen some of their recent releases and i pay attention to um, the demand that the market has for some of these books to do the bolo list every week. And it just seems very different from when they were initially announced. When they were initially announced, there was really a drive to get a lot of these, these books. And we've seen some of that wane a bit. So it will be interesting to see if they can kind of rebuild some momentum. But again, buying opportunity because this many big names attached to this many uh, kind of unique uh, 
independent series, some of these are going to get picked up. I really believe that. Some of these will end up being televisions or movies at some point. Um, and now is the time. I love buying independent books. We can buy them for cover price. We don't have to chase the dragon with them. So that's something to keep an eye out for. And I don't think the print runs on any of these are astronomical. And I would also keep an eye out for this Upshot Now number zero, which has that kind of like first appearance of so many of these books. Um, so you, here you've got uh, Fight Girls, Hotel, uh, Year Zero, Old Haunts, Devil's Highway, The Resistance, Archangel 8, and Red Border, as well as. Uh, temporal criminal all in one book yeah and each one of those i, I think i've read probably about 80 percent of them and liked every single one of them so yeah. they're, they're great stories great creative teams it just seems like giving them momentum now hopefully i really hope they can develop that back up but right now they do seem to be have lost some of that traction and i hope i hope they gain it back like we said it's a great buying opportunity for those especially if you like great stories yeah and i have full faith in their chief uh creative officer who is actually axel alonzo who was once the head man for marvel so real star power involved in that company but there it is guys that's the three up three down this week we're putting the comments from last week's up on the screen right now let us know what you think of this list what did you know if what we didn't have on here that you might think is up or down, we always like to hear your comments. And one other thing, if you're a fan of back issues, always wanting to know what to be on the lookout for when you go to those LCSs, make sure you check out our weekly top 10 back issues to be on the lookout for. We are covering 10 each week. All those put together create one great master list for when you're going to out comic book hunting, right, Jack? Absolutely. And we're not talking about books that have already spiked. We're talking about Books that still have meat on the bone, giving you a wide variety of books, ranging from cover price, uh, long-term plays, to some of those iconic classic keys that are sure to be blue chips value into your collection. So you'll see that playlist pop up on the screen here in just a second. But with that being said, this is Brian Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.